do not touch that dial. We are in charge of the podcast. When Greg's away, the cat and JP Mint will play. So hang on and get ready for the show. Hey, welcome to the International Teacher Podcast. I'm Kent, the host guy, and I'm here with JP Mint. And our special guest today is Mark Weber. Greg might be joining us. Matt's out doing his thing with his kids. Mark Weber, welcome to the ITP Podcast. Woohoo! Okay, well, uh, I'm originally from the United States, but I've been out here uh, working, teaching, and now recruiting internationally for international schools uh, for the past 23 and a half years. Currently, what I'm doing is I'm recruiting specifically for schools in Latin America. Um, I've been doing that for about the past 12 years, and also I still do some teaching. I was a teacher and administrator for 23 years, 11 of that in the United States, 12 of that internationally, and I'm just living the life, man, having a good time like you good folks over there. And can you tell us the num- the name of your company, Mark? Yeah, it, Weber's Ed, and it does. We do a few things. As I mentioned already, we do recruitment specifically for schools in Latin America. We found that that was a niche market that a lot of people had a hard time paying attention to, just simply because it's hard to make money in Latin America. But also, I do teaching. I, I was a, a fine arts administrator and a theater dire- uh, teacher and director and also debate and public speaking. And then since the pandemic, I've been doing online uh, debating, um, teaching online debating kids in Asia and kids in Latin America. And I actually discovered that I love online teaching. I did not think I was going to like it. And um, I just have had a wonderful experience with that. And I'm going with that, man. We're rolling. Where do the two of you cross paths? Well, I Mark's been on my radar for a number of years. I've always seen his posts in Facebook with um, Weber Z. And, uh, and then I would say, I think it was this fall, I reached out to him and I wrote a tip, a job search tip on Weber Z. I reached out to him because I was curious uh, for my clients if they would need to pay for his services. And lo and behold, I found out they were free for candidates. And I told him, I said, you need to put that in bold print because I had no idea. I had to sort of go through the the webpage to find out. So he's since really, you know, put that to the forefront that he is free for candidates and he works with the schools to find them the great teachers that he, he can. Yeah, and I appreciate that because, you know, that was something I just kind of overlooked and I th- I thought it was there or clear enough. But I, as you said, I put that in our newsletter and our advertisements. I kind of turned it into a slogan. We're always free for teachers. We always have been free for teachers and we always will be. And that is our modus operandi. That's how we want to work here. We feel like the teachers, man, they, they, they deserve to be sought after and the schools deserve to pay. Both of you are in... Uh, Latin America, South America. And I think our, the ITP crowd would love to hear a firsthand account of what is the South American, Latin American too. What are those markets like? Can you describe it to us and talk about what the opportunities there are for teachers in those markets? One of the things that I, I've actually lived in in, so, in South America, I actually still live part-time in Colombia because we have a house there and I go back and check on it. We're here in Costa Rica right now in Central America uh, because my wife's job, she's a head of school, a rectora, and um, she's uh, killing it over here, you know, so I can work from anywhere and but what i love about the latin american markets is there's lots of good opportunities here for teachers one of the things that i think is important to know is that people come here for lifestyle they don't come here for the money for the most part now there are a small handful of schools that you could probably uh Uh, make as much money as just about anywhere else in the world. But those, as you might guess, those schools are very, very competitive. 
However, that's one of the issues or the challenges here in Latin America, besides people's perception of Latin America after watching Narcos on Netflix, you know, um, (laughs) is that it is harder to make money here. But, you know, of course, schools are not going to put you in a situation that's untenable. It's not good for them. It's not good for you. You're not going to stay here. So mostly the schools will pay you enough money and provide you enough benefits like housing and insurance and other little bells and whistles that come with that, that where you can have a comfortable lifestyle. You can travel a bit about around Latin America. It's cheaper than other parts of the world. Granted, we've all been hit by inflation, but that's not unique to Latin America, you know? And so we're all suffering a little bit with that, but I do see the schools adapting. I just visited one of the schools that I work with here in Costa Rica last week, and they talk about how they've raised their salary 17% to try to beat the inflation. And I think that's what a lot of schools are trying to do. You know, they, like I said, they don't want to put people in a bad situation. But the great thing about the market here, this is a great place to break into international curriculum. If you're trying to learn the IB or the some of the other international curriculums out there that you don't have experience with, and you see that as a barrier into getting into some of the more competitive markets, this is a great place to come and learn that. The other thing is obviously the lifestyle. I mean, one of the, you know, if you look at the statistics that ISC puts out and they're one wonderful surveys that they do. One of the major reasons people come to international teaching is to get to experience other cultures, to learn other languages, to see other parts of the world on a teacher's salary. And so you can definitely do that here. And then the the other big thing that I see is teachers and educators that are a bit more experienced that want to break into administration because it is a bit less competitive because of the lower pay, pay, this is an excellent place to do that. And so, you know, bring it. So I want to unpack, Mark, I want to unpack what you've just said, because you... You've run through so many good reasons why people need to start looking at Central and South America and Mexico. I'm including, I'm not including Mexico because they're very North American, but I want to also include Mexico in there. Is that, so first you're saying, and and you've said it a few times, um, that the pay is not, we need to clarify that the pay is not what you would expect, but neither is the cost of living. So that's really important to keep in mind when, you're looking at the salaries, you might be shocked. You might get the opposite of sticker shock, like how low it is. But then when you start to realize that, you know, the weekly groceries, your housing is paid for, your weekly groceries cost next to nothing, especially if you're eating locally. Um, So you've mentioned pay a few times, but you also talk about this is a great place to break in to international schools, um, to get your feet wet if you're a qualified and experienced teacher from your home country, but you haven't been overseas yet, you don't know about the IB programs, or perhaps even, you know, um, working in a British or an American school, but you don't have that much experience. This is a great place to come because as you're pointing out, the competition is a little bit lower uh, because it's just not on everyone's radar to come here. It's almost one of those things where people come to uh, the Americas, you know, South, Central, Mexico, when they've already had the experience of saving some money, putting some money aside, then they start thinking about um, coming. Also, not just getting experience as an international teacher, but if you're looking to take that step into administration, um, from the sounds of it, Mark, you're suggesting that they take a look at Central and South America because they're looking for admin. They're willing to work with brand new admin out of the box who who have their credentials, who have the experience, but they just haven't um, had their foot in the door for admin just yet. Yeah, in some cases, that is very true. In fact, we're working on a position right now for a vice principal for that school that I mentioned that I was visiting last week. And they're, and, the, and, and it's a vice principal IB coordinator position. And they're willing to take someone that has a really strong knowledge of the IB, but maybe hasn't been an IB coordinator before. And that's a bit unique on the international circuit because, of course, the higher paying regions can demand what they want, you know, the experiences that they want. But 
here in Latin America, they're willing to work with you. They're willing to train you, provide you the professional development to help you be successful in those areas. And then finally, you mentioned lifestyle. And Kent was asking kind of from the two of us, because we both live in Latin America, um, what are some of the benefits? Can we talk about that a little bit, Mark? What are some of the benefits of living in Latin America? Well, as a fat man, I will tell you straight up that food is one of the benefits, man. <laughs> it's like the food is off the hook. Just Sign about, me up. Yeah, just about everywhere you go, man. The, you know, as you know, in Mexico, I think they're one of the best food countries in the world, you know, as a lot of people really enjoy Mexican food. But also you have that stuff like down when I go to Colombia, I get a lot of fresh seafood, a lot of Caribbean uh type cuisine that is just amazing and and uh, lots of different things you know that you can experience that are different cultural dishes like the sancocho in colombia the soups and stuff like that just amazing stuff but also the travel opportunities to go to different places that you've only read about heard about maybe seen on tv or on youtube and that you get the opportunity to go at, to these places and actually see them in person. There's some of the finest beaches in the world that you could ever travel to. Um, you know, some of the most beautiful scenic mountain places. And it's just all all different kinds of terrains that you can experience. Of course, there's also the idea of learning a new language. In most of uh, Latin America, the language is Spanish. But as you go from country to country, you find out that the Spanish is, you know, Mexican Spanish is definitely different than Argentinian Spanish. But also Brazil, one of the largest countries here in Latin America, they speak a very beautiful dialect of Portuguese and it is really quite amazing as well but also the the you know the artistic culture that's here for me I'm a theater director and theater teacher and I love the arts I really love visual arts you could not find probably few better places in the world to experience visual arts than in Mexico, you know, considering all the amazing artists and writers and people that have lived there. But that's also true of many of the other countries like Colombia and Chile, you know, that have some of the most profound artists ever in the world that, um, you know, writers and, and, and thinkers and people like that. And so you get to really, you know, get in, involved in that and i was just looking at some old photos because i needed to get rid of some of the photos on my phone and stuff like that and i was looking at the hay festival that they have in cartagena um right there very close to where our house is in colombia just an hour and a half away you know and you can go to things like that you can just see things that you know some of the theater festivals the outdoor theater festivals they do it big you know that was a big lesson i learned as a theater director don't apologize for doing outdoor theater do it bigger you know and it's it's amazing so i just think there's so many things to see and do and experience here that you know it just you can never run out of things to do so you really haven't thought about it very much, in other words, is what you're saying. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> you know, you make me want to just move right right to your part of the world. JP, man, doesn't that sound amazing? Yeah, I want to piggyback on a couple of those points you brought up. So one of them, uh, the beach. You know, I'm not much of a beach person or, or sun person, but I've now... Uh, recently been to Puerto Vallarta with Mama Mint and then I'm returning to the same the same ocean of the Pacific coast um, for another beach holiday just in a couple of weeks and the uh, sorry JP thing- Mint you make you make yourself sound like a salmon that you return to the place of your birth <laughs> she's, the same she's the same beach you, so you she made can the, spawn. the whole journey <laughs> yeah. sorry JP Mint. so but I, but to say that these holidays are are so affordable especially once you're in country and you you can do that sort of pricing and scouting for Something that's a little bit more local, like this beach bungalow that I'm renting is going to be... Where are you going? What, what beach are to, you going to? 
I couldn't tell you, but it's called La Something. Is it in Nayarit, in Nayarit or is it in Maza? Where? Yes. Nayarit? Yeah. It's in I Nayarit. I haven't been there yeah. yet, but I've heard that is just amazingly off the hook. Yeah. Well, this beach bungalow is six. It's a boutique hotel. It's got six rooms and it opens onto the beach and it has a private pool, but it also has its own sort of just right straight into the ocean not this kind of fancy resort all-inclusive swim right, up, right, bar yeah. that kind of thing i'm not into that i'm more into the finding these nice little niche places and so affordable i think i'm paying 350 dollars for four nights so you know it it makes holidays living and and vacationing inside country or in the countries that surround so affordable that on a salary on a teacher's or an admin salary, you can easily afford these kinds of places. Whereas when you're teaching back home in say the States or in the UK to try and have a Mexican beach holiday, you're talking huge airline costs, the the big travel costs and and we get to do it, right, Mark? We get to do it just on a fly on a weekend. Yeah, we can we can hit the beach in an hour and a half here in Costa Rica. I mean, we're in the capital of San Jose because that's where my wife works. But if we want to jump in the car and throw our little dogs in the back and we can be at the beach in an hour and a half, really secluded little beach. And we take our little body boards and go out there in the water and stuff. But just up from Nayarit, where you're going, one is one of my favorite beaches in Mexico. If you go up the coast a bit to Mazatlan and you want to talk about cheap, 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 really good stuff. And that's where they have the big uh, brass bands that are walking through the streets, playing music for you. And they'll stop right there. And for a few pesos, you know, they'll play you a few nice songs. And oh man, I just love it there. It's gorgeous. And another thing I love about Latin America are the people, right? I think that uh, I haven't been outside of Mexico yet. I'm hoping to go to Colombia in a few months to, to sort of be able to compare. But in Mexico, I find they are some of the warmest people on the planet. They are so hospitable, so welcoming. There is not that feeling like you and us or or them and us. It's it's definitely a we here. And uh, I feel embraced by my neighbors, by my friends. They're all open to making new friends from all over the world. And I think that's, that's uh, one of the pluses in coming to work in Latin America is that the people are so warm and friendly. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Including in like a major city like Mexico City, where Mexico City, the entire surrounding area, 25 million people. The people there are amazing. I've gotten off the, the metro subway before and been lost and had an elderly lady walk me actually to the house where I was going. You know, who does that in a big city? Or one time I had migraines and I had to stop on the side of the road with my bike. People were stopping in their car going, do you need something? Can we go to the pharmacist for you? Can we call you a doctor? I mean, I was just blown away. And it was like five or six people that did that just in that one go. And I was like, yeah, it, they are amazing. That is for sure. All right. Quick question for you, Mark Weber. Our guest today is Mark Weber. Uh, you are kind of run a recruiting agency, Mark Weber's Ed. Uh, if I reach out to you, what can I expect my experience to be like when I reach out to you? Sure. So the first thing is I, I warmly welcome people to reach out to us specifically. I'll, you'll see me putting my email address out there on Facebook sites for people to just contact me through my direct business email. Um, one of the things that I did when I started doing this 12 years ago is we wanted to disrupt the market by giving personal service. And I really feel like that that's one of the things of just focusing only on Latin America helps me to do is that I actually get an opportunity to uh, communicate with people. I was supposed to have a meeting yesterday, but the lady moved it to tomorrow and she just wants to talk to me about Latin America. And I'm happy to take those calls with people, you know, and I'll spend 45 minutes on, on, uh, online with them, talking to them about it. But also I tell people when you come through Colombia or you come through, and this is for 
for you too, JP. When you come through Colombia or you come through Costa Rica, let me know. We'll go have a beer or a coffee together or lunch, you know, and that's one of my favorite parts of the job is just getting to know people and, and meet them in person and stuff. And I've made some really good friends just doing that alone, but I love it because it gives kind of a personal touch, you know, and people know that like, Hey, I talked to this guy. I sat there, you know, at the table with him and I feel like I can trust him. And I really feel like that that's a big part of what our company is about is creating that trust because, you know, anytime you go anywhere in the world that's new, that you're taking a leap of faith there. But definitely if you think about what people see and hear and think about Latin America, you know, you want to go that extra step. I mean, I can't be the person that decides their security level for them. They have to make those decisions on their own. But I do try to advise them about how to do the research and how to look at that. And so that's that's a big thing that I think that we bring to bringing to the table here, you know, is like, hey, we're not going to run your resume through an ATS system or whatever. I'm going to look at it by hand. I'm going to tell you if I think a school is a good situation for you or not, especially people that have children, man. I certainly do not want to put them in a situation that's not going to work for them. And so I'll let them know, you know, yeah, I think this is a good gig, but maybe not so good for your kids. And you might want to think about that, you know. You bring up a good point about kids, Mark, because when uh, families are recruiting, you know, if it's a teaching couple or if it's if it's one teacher and a trailing spouse and they have children, they often will overlook Central and South America thinking, well, they have to know Spanish. Their kids are going to need to know Spanish to get in. Can you can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I want to backtrack a little bit. I didn't mean to give the impression that you can't bring kids to Latin America. Of course you can. And there's lots of safe places and safe schools for them to be in. And that's the thing is, yeah, they don't necessarily have to know Spanish. But as you know, it is always a little bit easier if you at least know some Spanish or you at least make the attempt to learn some Spanish. People really respect that and appreciate that if you will do that. But it's not a requirement to do here. I would say for the kids, it's definitely helpful for them to be able to socialize better in schools and stuff like that. I do think that like, you know, a lot of the kids in the schools, they want to speak Spanish with their friends. And so if you don't speak Spanish, you might feel a little bit left out. But as we know, kids are much better at learning languages quick, more quickly than we are as older people. You know, I mean, I've, I've struggled with that. And I grew up in a house where my dad and my stepmom spoke Spanish, but they didn't speak it to us, you know, because they didn't want us to have the accent and all of that stuff. There's a lot of discrimination in Texas and the U.S., you know, and that was what they were trying to avoid. But I really regret not learning it growing up. But, you know, it, that's that's what people say. You know, a lot of times people say, well, how can I, you know, do international teaching? I have children. I'm like, there's people who do international teaching just because they have children, because you can now afford to give your, your kid a good private school education to allow them to learn new languages, allow them to experience other cultures and really broaden their worldview. And I, I think if I had kids, that would be definitely one of the main reasons I would be working abroad is to give my kids that kind of opportunity. If uh, I may be so bold to ask each of you, let's just do a, a lightning round, if you will. We'll start with Mark and then JP Mint. I'm going to say the name of one of the, of the countries uh, one at a time in Latin America. And give me a, just a sense. Is it hot? Is it a hot market from your perspective? Is it medium or is it a cool market? Just so our listeners can get a sense of where the action is in Latin America. Is this okay with you, JP? Okay. All right, Mark, you get uh, about 15 seconds. Belize. Belize, I understand, only has one or two schools. I don't know much about Belize. I, I would like to travel there, but as far as the international schools, I think there's only one or two. It's also a kind of expensive country, not so hot. JP, anyone ever reach out and say Belize is... I think it's English, English, English speaking. Is that right? It's a former English colony. So, so it's a good option for people with um, less Spanish. That's all I know about it. Next. Okay. Um, hot, 
medium or cool, uh, Mark? Costa Rica. Ah, Costa Rica. I would argue that the, here in San Jose <laughs> is one of the most competitive markets in all of Latin America. People want to come here to Costa Rica because of the security and also because of the, a, a lot of Americanized creature comforts here in the city of San Jose, you know. So that it is a very hot market. JP? What I know about Costa Rica is it's a big retirement community. So for that reason, you know, you might, uh, like, like Mark say, has a lot of um, the creature comforts that we're used to. So it's a nice, it would be a nice place to sort of segue from a home country that you have never left. And then you go to Costa Rica, you have a little bit of exotic, you have a little bit of familiar. And then from there, you can go to China. <laughs> <laughs> Back to you, Mark. Uh, El Salvador. Yeah. El Salvador's picking up for a lot of reasons. And I loved JP's reaction to El Salvador. First of all, I've been there and 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 there's some, some really good schools in El Salvador and it is a beautiful country. However, a lot of people I think have mixed reactions about it because of the current president there and what he's doing to make. And a lot of people, and I see this people that are not involved in the government say it has become significantly more secure, but at what cost? Because the government is locking up a lot of people and not giving them their due process. These are local people, not foreigners that are getting locked up, but they really are uh, cracking down on sometimes even innocent people to try to make the country more secure because they've had a major gang problem in the past. But people say it is much more secure than it was for many years. Uh, JP Min, El Salvador. Uh, I'll just, I'll just pass on that one. <laughs> we can have that discussion later. <laughs> if, if the El Salvador government is listening, we, Hey, I, we, I've got a few things I could say to Bukele. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not worried about him. <laughs> I'm going to take his Bitcoin away from him. <laughs> We're going to draft a letter of apology I later to all yeah, the El Salvadorians. Okay. Dear, dear El Salvador. Okay, uh, back to you, Mark. Guatemala. Yeah, Guatemala also um, it, it actually has, there, here's a positive story in Latin America. Arevalo, the president that just got um, uh, inaugurated this past weekend, really looks very promising for Guatemala. I mean, it is a good market for international teaching and stuff, and I think Guatemala is beautiful. I think it's one of the, the most underrepresented uh, countries in Latin America, and I am, have high hopes for the new president that he'll be able to do something about some of the corruption there. Uh, JP Mick, Guatemala. Yeah. The Colegio Mayo, Maya, Colegio Maya has been on my radar for a few years. Uh, and I, I think that depending on where you, you apply and where you go, it would, it could be very, it, it could be a very good step in the right direction for your career and, you know, for, for lifestyle as well. Yeah, Maya is a beautiful school. Uh, back to you, Mark. Honduras. Honduras is, a, yeah, I do a little bit of recruiting for Honduras. I would say it's one of those markets where people still are a little bit hesitant because they, they perceive it to be a little bit dangerous. But honestly, if you do the research on it and, and you realize that in most of Latin America, you know, the negative things that you hear about it doesn't happen to people like us. It's people that are like in a drug gang or doing something illegal, you know, that fall into these things these kind of situations. I'm not saying something couldn't happen to anyone anywhere, Chicago, Houston, you know, those kind of things. But, but overall Honduras is an okay market. Um, and, and there are a couple of really good schools over there that I, I would recommend for sure. JP. Well, you'll notice a lot of times I'm not saying a lot because Mark is the expert on this. So I'm going to, I'm going to give him the, give him the, the floor more often because he, he does know he's been to these places. Well, let me ask you this, JP, when people reach out to you, have you had clients ask you, say your opinion or say, Hey, I want to apply at this school in Honduras. Is it on the radar screens of people who reach out to you for international teaching? It is not. Unfortunately, not yet. I think Latin America is still 
is still very much unknown. And that's why I wanted Mark to come onto the show today, because I want to put it on people's radar that they don't need to be either at the beginning or at the end of their career to consider Latin America. They can consider it at any time in their career. Uh, Mark, Nicaragua. Yeah, Nicaragua has a few good schools in there too. I would say they're kind of along the same situation. Um, there's where I'm here in Costa Rica. There's a lot of Nicaraguanos here, and they say that the country is pretty safe and 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 they feel like it's a good situation. And I've been talking to people recently who have been applying because we do recruit for a couple of schools in Nicaragua, and um, they they're applying there, um, and they feel very happy to go there. And some of these countries you've just mentioned, one of the things I think that JP's saying that's spot on is people don't necessarily think of those countries first. Usually it's they have a, a, a connection there, like they know someone from there, or they went on a church retreat there when they were in university or high school or whatever, or, you know, they just somehow came across it and found it interesting. But there, but there are schools there, and there's some good schools there, and, and that people could dive into and and do well. Okay, awesome, awesome. Let's go to Panama, Mark Panama. Yeah, Panama is a really hot market. They're a lot like Costa Rica in the sense that um, people consider it to be the safer uh, uh, and more Americanized, U.S. Americanized uh, spaces. And I think a lot of people like that, especially like what JP said a while ago. If they're just starting to get out there, the, it's a good way to get your dip your foot in the water and see what international teaching is like. The a lot of people consider Panama the cheaper version of Costa. Rica. Rica, and uh, that's another thing that they really like there. And of course, the beaches are off the hook. You know, if you are a beach person, and uh, I, I'm a little offended by JP not being a beach person, but uh, uh, she's got lots of reasons to love her, so no worries. Uh, but the thing is that, um, yeah, it's one of those places that you can go on the weekends and just live in in luxury. You know. You'll remember Ricardo, one of our former guests, he grew up in Panama and from Panama and then uh, went to one of the international schools there um, opened by uh, Chiquita Bananas for the for the workers. And, and but ISP has always also been on my radar, uh, International School of Panama. I've known a lot of good people come come out of that school as uh, teachers and admin, and they've all they've always been on my radar. So if any of my clients are looking for Panama, I'm definitely pointing them in that direction. ISP is a good school, but there's also several other really good schools there. I do think it's a hot market, very close to what we have here in Costa Rica. Sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to get that part in. And before we get to Mexico, uh, let me ask you, the Caribbean, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Haiti, any other countries in there? Uh, Mark, anyone ever ask you questions or reach out to you about the Caribbean? Yeah, we get that quite a lot. You know, of course, the Dominican Republic is quite popular and there's a lot of competitive schools there. But even there's an American school in Cuba and it is actually considered a pretty good school. And and uh, they I know they had a really strong head of school there a couple of years ago. I think he's moved on since then, and I'm not sure who the head of school. I've never had the opportunity to recruit for them, but but I would if I ever got the chance. But there's also other great places like Curaçao, which is a really beautiful country and a great dive place, you know. Um, there, so there's there's uh, places like that that have some really good schools uh, there. And, and, and it's not a lot of them, but there's a, quite a lot of them out there. The ones that I see that I'm not that familiar with, they're like the schools in the Caymans and stuff like that. I'm just not that familiar with them. And the other thing is, I see a lot of turnover there. So I'm not really sure what to think about. I think a lot of times with those uh, countries, Kent, it's, I talk about island fever, you know, so uh, I had a client that was asking me about Cayman Islands just the other day. And I said, you know, it can be a really good option for a couple of years to sort of see, like, first of all, to get international experience, to see what you like about living overseas. But also keep in mind that, you know, island fever is real. I've had uh, several friends leave from Cayman after five years. I couldn't believe they managed to stay five years. I thought, wow, that is a testament to 
you know, what the, what the schools and what the, the islands can offer. But I do, I do always try and let them know about um, that island fever. Mark, Mexico. Yeah. Well, I have to say I'm biased about Mexico. I'm half Mexican from the United States, but I also spent seven years in Mexico, and I frequently have this debate with my friends that Mexico is the greatest country in the world. And I just love Mexico. There's so much to love about Mexico. There's so many places to go there and things to do. It is absolutely amazing. And as for an international teaching market, it's a very big market market for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons, and this is something that neither of us or none of us brought up so far in this discussion, one of the reasons people love Latin America is if they're from the U.S., it's an easy trip home. And especially people who couldn't get back to see their families during the pandemic, a lot of them have given that reason as to why they're trying to shift to Latin America now. But Mexico is one of the most beautifully artistic countries in the world. If you travel anywhere in Latin America, or really anywhere in the world, you're hearing Mexican music, people are trying to make Mexican food, you know, and things like that. And there's just so much about it to really love. You can never run out of things. Even just if you just stayed in Mexico City, you could never run out of things to do in that city. I was there for seven years, and I still want to keep going and doing things. Well, I have to agree wholeheartedly with Mark. Uh, I, you know, living in, I think I'm up to seven or eight countries where I lived in 25, 30 years. Mexico by far is one of my favorites. It's, um, it does have everything. It has, the geography is crazy. I, you know, coming to Mexico, I thought, okay, it's just going to be all beaches, but obviously it can't be all beaches. There has to be some central part. And that's where I live in the mountains. And I have cool weather and I have sort of this moderate climate all year long, no humidity. I really, cause it was always picturing Cancun or Puerto Vallarta when I thought of Mexico, but the range of geography in this country is amazing. The breadth of travel, different cities have different things to offer. Mexico City, of course, being one of them, but there's, I mean, Guadalajara is where I lived for two years. And they like to say that they're the heart of the Mexican culture. You know, mariachis come from Guadalajara and uh, the sombrero and the. Tortos ahogadas. Um, totally. <laughs> The torta hogadas, but also I'm blanking. There was one more thing. Oh, the the little mouse. You know, we all grew up watching the little mouse. What's Speedy? his name? Speedy Gonzalez comes from Guadalajara. So there's just <laughs> so much, so much of the. Well, I would say Mexican, I always thought but also, he was a fictional you know, the character. Culture that we know. <laughs> I don't know. He's from Guadalajara. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. I should have known by the sombrero. Yeah. But uh, oh, there's boy. so much to discover here, and that's what I love. They they embrace their history. They embrace, you know, all the way back to Mayans, the Aztecs, and um, and the language. Uh, the the number of times I cannot pronounce a word because it has about 17 consonants and three vowels, and I know that that's going to be one of the indigenous languages that they're respecting. And they're bringing it back and, and people are talking like I've I've ran into people talking these languages now. It's, it's really coming back. And I I I can't say enough. I, I absolutely love Mexico. For sure. What do you think, JP Min? Well, I do want to hear Mark's rundown on his international experience, because he did he did touch upon this a few times with the theater and the debate. So, Mark, can you tell us a little bit if you've been overseas and where you've been and where you've taught? Sure, sure. So, as I mentioned, I'm originally from Texas. I grew up there, and I started my teaching career there, and I taught for 11 years in the city, in, in and around Houston, okay, Houston, Texas. And um, then I met my ex-wife, my first wife, uh, they, uh, there in Houston, and she had been doing international teaching in Thailand, and she came as a long-term sub to the school I was working at. And 
And she um, was the one who kind of got me, not kind of, she straight up got me into international teaching because after we met and started dating, she's like, I just need to let you know I'm going to go back out there. And so um, after my parents passed away, both my parents passed away really close together, like three months apart, even though they hadn't seen each other in like 25 years. And that really kind of did me in. And so I sold all my stuff and I got rid of my truck, my furniture, all of that stuff. And I took the money and I went and backpacked the route of Che Guevara around uh, South America because I was really into reading about Che and all of that stuff at that time. And I went and worked on a ranch in Argentina for a month so I could learn enough Spanish to get around because I didn't have you know, access to Spanish language. I mean, I had access. I didn't take advantage, I should say. And so then I started, my ex got our first job in Venezuela at uh, Coleo Internacional de Caracas, which I recruit for now. Very excited about that. But there was only a job there for her and not for me. And I told her, I said, don't worry, I'm a cat. I always land on my feet, you know. We'll find something. And dumb, stupid luck, I just got a job job at Escuela Campo Alegre, which is another school I'm now recruiting for. And um, I worked for Bambi Betts. So if you know anything about the international teaching market, you know, she's quite the big fish there, you know, and it was just, I mean, wonderful lady, wonderful start to my career. And she's the one who recommended me on for my next job, where I went to the International School of Kuala Lumpur. I got headhunted by them because they were looking for a director of performing arts and a theater manager. And so because I have experience in teaching theater as well as the technical side of theater, I was kind of a shoe in for the position and I got to go from there to go and work for Bill Powell another very big fish in the international education market. Uh, rest in peace, Bill. Wonderful man. One of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And I spent four years there and then um, uh, when we decided to go on from there, I got into a really cool position where I was the director of fine arts for the entire school in Khartoum, Sudan, uh, at uh, Khartoum International Community School. A fabulous school. Uh, really unfortunate, the situation that they're going through right now in Sudan, you know, and I hope people will pay attention to that and try to get some resolution there. But it's the first time I've ever heard these words in my life, unlimited fine arts budget, because the owners of the school um, are very wealthy people in Sudan, but also very socially just people, wonderful people. And their daughter is a professional theater director in England, and they wanted to have a top flight fine arts program. And they said, look, money's not an issue as long as you can produce the program. And I, so I stayed there for three years. I got to build an ent help build an entire fine arts program. I got to design and equip the black box theater. I mean, it was just amazing experience. I got to work with Africa's top female playwright. And we actually, our first play production was a world premiere of one of her plays and we get to hire her to come to our school and work with our students and to watch my little African girls light up in her presence was just one of the most ex amazing experiences I've ever had and so then after that we decided to come to Mexico and that is kind of where my ex-wife and I split up we're still friends and very friendly and talk frequently in fact when I was in Houston last time Time. She came over to my aunts to visit and all that stuff. And, um, and when she was leaving, I said, hey, look, I can totally understand you leaving me. I cannot understand you leaving Mexico. But she did, and she went back to Houston, and she's working at an international school there. And then that's where I met my current wife. Now, this was after I'd sworn off women. I was never going to get in another relationship again. And I met my current wife uh, after a couple of years of being on my own <laughs> out there. And um, 
we went, uh, we, she was working in Mexico. And like I said, she's a rectora. She's a head of school. She's British too. And we went on from there to Colombia, where she was the head of the British International School in Barranquilla, where Shakira is from and where Carnival is about to take place. And um, I, in fact, I'll be going there next week, but I'll be coming back here before Carnival. I've done it a few times. I'm, I'm over it. And, uh, and so um, <laughs> in these last 12 years or so, I've been doing recruitment and then uh, teaching online most recently. That's kind of was my track around uh, the world for a bit. And I too, I think I'm on my seventh country to live in. And do you think Costa Rica will be your last? Uh, no, I don't know. You know, what's going to happen? Uh, who knows when it's going to be my last? But, uh, you know, we're open to anything. When you were saying about island fever a while ago, I was thinking, man, I'd like to get some island fever down in Trinidad and Tobago. <laughs> I've, I would love to live there for a while. It looks like an amazing place to go as well. We're totally open to wherever we go. My wife, she's the uh, same age as me, 60 years old, and she just got her MBA. She, and we went to England for her graduation and everything. And she loves working. I love working. So we don't know where we'll go. I mean, for now, uh, she's really enjoying her job here in Costa Rica in San Jose. She's the head of a school here and, and she's having a great time. And I want to just be, you know, supportive of her, you know, and she's the lead sled dog and I'm cool with that. And uh, let's just have fun. You know, that's the key to it all. Hey, uh, let me jump in there real fast. Mark, you said uh, the magic number in international education. You said 60. So many places in the Middle East and Africa and Asia, they kind of cut you off at 60 in this business. What's it like uh, in Latin America when you hit that number? Yeah, that's a really good question. I really appreciate you bringing that up. So that is something that happens even in Latin America. And some schools will tell you, oh, the government won't give us the visa, and that's not necessarily true. And some people will tell you, oh, but we can't do it because our insurance company won't allow us to insure them. So I have this little check thing I do on them. I'm like, okay, well, my client is willing to come with their own insurance. Will you just give them the stipend that you pay for everybody else? is insurance. And then I go from there on how they react to that question, because I think like, you know, how can you say no to that if it truly is about insurance? But, you know, the other thing is I respect that some schools have a different atmosphere that they're trying to get. But, you know, we pride ourselves in um, placing older people. We've actually placed candidates up to 73, 74 years of age. And our thing is this, we don't discriminate. We don't discriminate on where you're from. We don't discriminate on what your native language is. We don't discriminate on your gender or your marital status or, or sexual preference. We don't discriminate on your age. If you've got the CV, we're going to put you forward. Now, at the end of the day, the schools are the ones that make the decisions. But honestly, you know, and there's a lot of talk about this, especially since the pandemic and especially since DEIJ has really come to the forefront as it should have a long time ago. You know, we talk about these things a lot in there. And one of the things I've found is that, the, yes, the schools are more receptive than I think what people are giving them credit for. You know, and and so I'm very appreciative of the schools that are willing to take a chance on people that maybe some other regions wouldn't take. And we definitely will put them forward if they have the credentials that are required. Yeah, I think you bring up a really good point about not discluding yourself before you even apply. So a lot of times candidates will just say, well, I'm pretty sure they're not going to accept me, so I'm not even going to bother. But I wish they would. Because until they start applying, schools cannot hire them, right? They can't diversify their staff without the applications. And they need to see a lot of applications from the underrepresented groups to be able to start saying, okay, now we have a lot of choice. You bring up a good point about nationalities. You know, you don't discriminate bit about where a teacher is coming from. Can you talk a little bit about that sort of experience? Because I know that many of our listeners are not necessarily English native speakers. Would they have a place in Central or South America in the international school world? 
Yeah, sure. Absolutely. You know, and, and I think this is something that comes up a lot. And I'm really frank and honest with the people that I talk to. You know, if you're coming from India or the Philippines or some of the African countries or you're a person of color like I am, you know, the, you are going to have a little bit of a struggle. That's not new news to any of those people. They know that. That's their life. That's what they've lived through. But what, but I, I agree with you, JP, is that, you know, you can't hit the home, home run if you don't step up to the plate. And that that's what they need to do is they need to just put themselves forward, you know. And I also think that they need to also, you know, and I think they're aware of this, that they're going to struggle a bit. So maybe they need to modify their resume a little bit so that it looks more in line with what the schools are expecting. And that's what I do. That's what JP does. And there's quite a few of us out there that are either doing that for a small fee or even for free. We're, you know, putting content out there to help people uh, to be able to do that. And so I, I do know that those people are, are going to struggle. And when they come to me and they're like, why are, am I not getting a job? And I'm like, well, you know, this is the situation. We're putting you forward and maybe there's something in there. Sometimes we get feedback feedback from the schools, a lot of times we don't. And we try to seek it out or I try to, you know, at least take a good educated guess as to what I think is happening. And, you know, I had someone yesterday, she just wrote me yesterday and she's like, I'm getting rejected from all of these positions. I'm like, yeah, almost all your experience is in secondary and you're applying for a bunch of primary jobs. You haven't done primary except for one year since 2016. So you're not playing to your strength. You know, let's play to your strength. And while I agree, you know, totally with y'all that, you know, people should step up and go ahead and apply, you've also, it's got to also be with realistic expectations as well. And so you, if you've never been a principal or an administrator and you're applying for the head of school job, it's probably not going to happen, you know, and you, 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 you know, why waste your time on that? But it is good to you know, try to aspire to move up a bit. You know, everybody's looking for that and they're looking for the next big rising star, you know, and that's where rising stars are born here in Latin America, because this is where they can get those opportunities. Man, I am inspired by you, Mark Weber. JP, what else, do you have any more questions? Well, I really want to know if Mark has a police story, because I can only <laughs> imagine. Yeah. Mark, do you have a police story? JP, let's be honest. It's not does he have a police story, but does he have one that he could tell on the air? <laughs> uh, I have been kicked off of two flights before, so, you know. Never, I've never heard anybody be kicked off a flight. What did you do? Really? Oh, uh, well, yeah, one of them I definitely deserve to get kicked off the flight so no I was uh, I was on a flight I'd been working it really late and everything and I was going to meet my ex in Cancun and I was real and I had asked for an aisle seat because I'm a big guy you know and I, I'm a big guys we like aisle seats and they're like oh yeah yeah we gave you an aisle seat and I get on the plane and I'm stuck in the middle, you know? And so I asked the flight attendants, you know, can I have an aisle seat? I asked for an aisle seat. They promised me this was, and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they just kind of brushed me off, you know? And so then it kept going, it kept going, you know, and I, kept asking them I'm like can I have an aisle seat you know I was trying to be nice about it and they just kept blowing me off and then they went and got some lady who was like I mean really little lady and she walked up to me on the flight and she's like what do you want and I said I want a fucking seat on the aisle <laughs> and they're like you're out of here <laughs> <laughs> wow! That was, and it was my fault. I totally take the blame for that. And I have another one too that I'll tell you. It's actually better than this story. I just remembered it. But if y'all don't have time, oh, it's okay. One. Yeah, that's all right. No, I think we definitely have time for the second story. Okay, I think the second one you might be able to put on the air. Okay, but anyway, yeah. Sorry if I've shocked anyone with my bad language, but I. I I never really truly respect anyone <laughs> till they drop the f bomb, you know. <laughs> That's what Greg always says. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Because then you know your friends. Then you know. Okay, so I had this one other flight <laughs> where I was traveling to go meet a client in Colombia, and I purposely carried a carry-on bag, a little carry-on bag, with me, uh, so that I could um, just 
put it above and then take it off. And, and when I was getting back to Mexico, because I was doing debate classes for Libre de Derechos, it's a law school there in Mexico City. And I had just enough time to land, get through immigration, jump in a taxi, and make it to the school in time for my class. Well, when I got on the flight, someone had put their luggage, even though there were nobody sitting in the seats where I was at, somebody had put their luggage in our overhead bin, and there was no luggage space above there, and they were trying to make me put my luggage under the plane <laughs> to check it in. And I was like, no, I can't oh, check it in, because no. Mexi- you know Mexico City's one of the worst for getting mm. your luggage in time. You know, it's like... Say goodbye to that bag. Yeah, well, no, I, I mean, it wasn't about getting the bag, it was about being on time. And so I was like, no, I yeah. can't afford the extra 30 or 40 minutes it's going to take me to wait for my luggage. So please don't make me put my luggage underneath. I purposely brought this little bag so I could, and they're like, no, you have to put it underneath. And they were being really rude with me. I won't name the airline, but I hate this airline. Anyway, what I did is I just took one of the suitcases out that was up there and I put my suitcase up there and I just left it on the empty seats there. Well, they came back and they said, who, who moved this suitcase? Who put this suitcase there? And someone finally pointed at me. And I was like, well, I need to put my luggage up there. And they're like, this is the pilot suitcase. You cannot touch, uh, touch the pilot suitcase. And so anyway, I was like, okay, whatever. You know, I mean, he put, he, y'all are the pilots. You get off last. Put his luggage in the back or put his luggage underneath. He, he's got room in yeah, the cockpit. exactly. <laughs> What's he doing? You know, the space up there. So anyway, they're like, no, you now you have to di- dis, uh, you have to deboard the plane. You have to go with us. The pilot has to go with us, and we have to go and check and make sure you didn't put something in his luggage. I was oh like, my god! I'm like, what am I going to put? I'm trying to get out of here and get to work. What am I going to put in his luggage? So we get off, and he undoes his luggage, and they go through his whole luggage and all this stuff. Of course, I didn't put anything in there. So then we get back on the plane, and he's putting his luggage back up there, and I'm standing behind him, and I said, "Cry, baby," and he's like, "Oh, that's it. You're harassing me. Get off this flight." Oh, you're gone. And so they kick me off the flight for calling him a crybaby. <laughs> and oh so I gosh. was kicked off and I didn't make it back to Mexico in time. I had to buy a whole new ticket just to get back to Mexico City. And even the police were trying to take up for me. The police were like, come on, he didn't really do anything. But the pilot like, no, I get to say if he gets off the flight or what. And he's off the flight. He harassed me. You wish. Wow. Mm-hmm. That guy really is a crybaby. Yeah, that's what I thought. I was at least <laughs> right about that. See, being right is more important than getting thrown off of a flight. <laughs> JP, man, last words from you as we go around the horn. Well, I just want to say how delighted I was to have Mark come on to the show and talk up Central South America. I think our listeners got a big a big earful, I was going to say an eyeful, a big earful on the benefits and the reasons to come to Latin America, the reasons to, you know, put their hat in the ring and, and, and see what can come of it. And uh, so I really want to thank Mark for putting a spotlight on a part of the world that a lot of us have been ignoring. That's right. Uh, Mark, any final words uh, from you? No, the, just the one thing I would also say that we didn't add, Latin America is for lovers. It's, a, you know, one of the things that the candidates ask about a lot is where's the best dating scene? And I would say Latin America is very, very good for that. You know, if you're looking for a partner or something like that, the, the, Latin America is for lovers. And also one of the things is many, many of the cities are very LGBTQ friendly. And I'd like to pass that on to our LGBTQ friends because they're always looking for that kind of thing. You know, it is the, there is very religious, but also they are very accepting of people. And I want to say the other thing I couldn't think of was tequila, which goes really well with the Latin are for lovers, <laughs> Latin lovers. Tequila in Guadalajara is what it's famous for. And so now, of course, that naturally helped out my uh, romantic, my romantic life in Guadalajara. Cool. Have you been to tequila, the city? 
No, I did not get a chance. But I will, you know, I'm in Mexico forever. So I have tons of Do time it. to It's amazing. I spent my birthday weekend there about eight years ago. It's amazing. And you remember. That's <laughs> yeah. really good. Oh, no, I'm good at mem- <laughs> remembering it. That's the sad part. <laughs> uh, here at the ITP, we would like to thank our latest sponsor, Tequila. Our two new best friends. Hey, here from ITP, we want to give a warm thank you to our guest, Mark Weber. You can find him at webbersed.com, I believe. Webbersed.com. I want to thank JP Mint. You can find JP Mint at jpmintconsulting.com. You can find our usual host, Greg, at the <laughs> internet store paying his bill. And you can find me, Kent, the host guy, writing letters of apology to both El Salvador and Aero Mexico. Thank you for joining us this week. Thank you so much.